Hello and welcome to Student Affairs Live. I'm your host, Tony Duty, and I'm pleased to be joining you from my professional home at Rutgers University. We broadcast on the Higher Ed Live Network, and you can tune in to Student Affairs Live along with my brilliant friend and co-host, Heather Shea Gasser, Wednesdays at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. If you're unfamiliar with past episodes, I highly recommend you check out and favorite the archive link that we're tweeting out now. We're proud to have covered over 100 important topics with over 200 of the very top practitioners, scholars, leaders, and experts in the field. In a moment, I'll introduce you to two of those top scholars and experts, but we can't do that without first giving a shout out to the sponsors that make Student Fairs Live possible. Hired Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing communication firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. ACPA, College Student Educators International, is pleased to provide support for Student Affairs Live. One of the many ways you can be innovative with your own professional development, visit www.myacpa.org to discover the next way to engage with your own professional and personal development. ACPA provides a special institute just for mid-level managers. Registration is now open for the January program. Again, visit the ACPA website. Now, I also want to take a moment to thank Kate Zulo and Robin Janice, who are in the studio with me today, monitoring the back channel, and forwarding to me your best content with questions from the Twitterverse. And finally, I am very honored and pleased to have two good friends uh, and some of the top, top practitioners and scholars in this area, Dr. Josie Alquist and Dr. Ed Tabellan. Thanks for, for coming out and, and sharing some wisdom with us today, guys. And. Let's actually start off by having you each describe your current role and your motivation for researching, presenting, writing on such a range of issues related to digital topics over the course of your career. So let's go from left to right on my screen. So let's start with you, Josie. Hello. Great to be here. Uh, I am based in Los Angeles, but I teach and research online for Florida State University. Knowles. I also find my time traveling to college campuses, providing digital education to college students, faculty, and staff. Topics like digital leadership, digital wellness, social media strategy. Uh, and then I'm working on lots of different publications trying to unpack these digital tools for this real world that we have um, in helping students, helping staff, and I think part of the reason that I feel so drawn to it is there are so many unanswered questions. Um, even as we talk today about how we look at these tools differently now with post-election, you know, I may not have an answer, but there are things that we can pull from, from the work that we do um, and the roots of the ethics of what we do so we can um, move forward. So thanks for having me. Yeah. Ed, welcome. Hi, thanks, Tony. Hi, Josie. I'm so happy to be with you both today. Uh, I'm Ed Cabellan. I am from Bridgewater State University in southeastern Massachusetts. Uh, I'm the assistant to the vice president for student affairs, and um, I have been in higher education now for almost 20 years and in student <laughs> affairs for primarily uh, all of my career, dating back, um, you know, in my time in the residence halls and doing work and student activities and the union and orientation. And so I certainly, um, I think as, as folks who have known me over my career know that technology has always been an important piece of my work, trying to find out ways that we can use it to, you know, better improve our processes uh, and how we engage with one another. And so uh, when I started my doctoral process, you know, three years ago, um, almost four years ago now, um, I knew that the topics I'd be, um, you know, researching were going to be around technology. Um, I think I think most folks thought I'd do something social media related, but um, I knew at the time, even doing diving into the research that folks were doing, that um, you know, digital technology is a, a a better umbrella to really look at when we look at the variety and ways that folks use it. And so, my work now really looks at um, you know not only digital tools and digital technology, but the strategic use of those and being a senior student affairs officer, sitting in the central office in the vice president's area, I've had the opportunity to work uh, cross divisionally more often. So it's been fun discovering that. So I'm glad we're here to talk about the book today, Tony. Thanks for the invitation. Happy to answer these questions that are coming. So you, you bring up being in, in the, the you know the top level of senior 
uh, area of the division, and you've really been championing and, and successfully, I may add, the cause of digital education for quite some time. And I did read the book, and you intentionally decided to start the book with this, this focus on senior student affairs officers. So why and how do we best convince administrators and leaders to allocate the time and resource? Because there is, right, if we're being truthful, there is a commitment here um, to spend time on these issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, when, when Josie and I and, um, you know, the folks at Josie Bass were looking at this book and thinking about how we we're going to construct it, I think we've reached, reached the tipping point where we do need to call out um, and trying to inspire our senior leaders, um, both, you know, in the central office, our vice presidents, and the folks that they're connected to on cabinet. I think, you know, we forget that our senior student affairs officers, our VPs, they sit at tables that greatly influence the policies and the things that happen on our campuses. And so um, to me, it was a, you know, to us, I think it was a no brainer to figure out a way to include that as part of the book. Um, and I think I have a better appreciation now. I think when I was a director of this, of a union, you know, I, I remember saying on shows like this or even my writing back then saying, why aren't these student, senior student affairs officers more on Twitter? And why aren't they looking at it's because their time is so is so specifically spent. It's not that they don't want to. So I think you know a realization for me was this idea that they didn't want to. They do. For some, the degree to which they want to do it is relative to their own technology bias. And I write about that in my dissertation. And the model that that came out of my dissertation was acknowledging one's biases initially, because if and if and when a SSAO at any level wants to start using technology more strategically, more intentionally to achieve the goals of their division, they've got to unpack that at the door and say, all right, I really don't like social media. All right, why? Let's talk about that. Let's see where you might be able to fit in the spectrum of use of social media that isn't, isn't necessarily mainstream or how your younger staff are using it. Um, so one of the ways I've found success with, S with other SSAOs is just being a champion and using the technology in ways they didn't realize they could. Whether it's using Evernote in a meeting where, you know, you take Evernote and you start taking pictures of agendas and showing how you can write on it within the actual app itself or, you know, doing voice recordings with that. I think there's little ways that we can be examples for one another, especially with our senior staff, um, and that they don't have to be doing social media, but they can be lurking, and that's okay. And that, that information could help them do their jobs better. So I think first and foremost is just making sure they acknowledge their biases and working with them on that, and then being a really good example. So, so related to this, Josie, you, you write about how fear-mongering by parents and teachers has had an opposite effect on students. So can you talk a little bit about that, and, and also how fear and trepidation has hampered adoption by all student affairs professionals. Sure, so that really builds on what Ed was just talking about, is that we need to recognize our own biases, our own perceptions, and what I talk about, what's the lens that you're bringing in when someone even talks about technology or encourages you to be on Twitter. Um, and that's why I also strategically have done research on senior student affairs officers who are really using these tools and want to jump right in so we can start to show examples of this is a really great, great case model um, and, and to build from there. And that's why we built the book um, like that in a strategic kind of political way to show that value add um, and not just this cool factor and the students are on it. So my chapter a lot talks about, okay, well, let's talk about how you feel about these tools, uh, your experiences with them, positive and negative, and what your place is in your position, but also as a whole person. Um, because there's an impact on our students that we're not realizing maybe our own negative perceptions come out in the way that we have conversations, we build policy, we have education around technology. So this came out in my dissertation. I think it also came out in Paul Gordon Brown's as well and the work of like Dana Boyd that students know very clearly what adults don't want them to do. Uh, there's been lots of fear put into their minds as early as middle school, um, the TV show To Catch a Predator came up in every single one of my focus groups. Uh, their parents and teachers and aunts and uncles and grandmas just petrified they were going to be abducted if they were to go online. Where 
I don't know, when I was online, I went on the Oregon Trail when I was that, you know, when I was young. Um, and so to start to have real conversations about students' experiences, like what they're actually wanting to go online for, um, if those negative experiences for them actually exist, it's almost like you need to talk to your kids and your students about social media just like you would about sex and drugs and rock and roll, right? We need to have open conversations about the usage and not just the restriction of it. Uh, I hope someone caught that tweet. That, that, that's definitely a tweet, tweetable Josie Alquist moment there. I'm going to retweet that. <laughs> so, Ed, this this for you. Technology is such a broad term, and, and you talked about using Evernote. You know, but figuring out where to start can really be daunting. It, does, does every student affairs professional need to know how to use Photoshop, Basecamp, Google Drive? There was so many, thousands upon thousands of possible tools and applications. Where do you recommend folks start? Yeah, I don't, I don't believe, Tony, that we have to start have a, having a class in technology. And I think that bucks some of the things that you know, we've talked about over the years as we've explored you know, the importance of technology and graduate programs and whatnot. You know, I think first we have to develop a more open mindset around technology integrated within the things that we already do. And not only looking at what we already do per se, but looking at ways that we make we could do it better with different technology. And so, I ask four questions to folks typically around this. When and um, again, this is part of what my dissertation work was about. But the first thing I ask is like, look, how can we develop this program, this service in a digital format? Like first and foremost. So no matter what area of student affairs you're in, you are delivering some sort of service or program that will help with engagement, retention, um, persistence, you know, one of those topics. And so are you developing a digital form of that? And you know, for example, for my friends in financial aid, one of the things we hear often in, in, in enrollment is that this process for FAFSA is really hard and it's really confusing. So why do we continue to create websites with all of this text when we can create infographics and flow charts that would make it so much easier for families particularly from first generation um, households and low income households to understand that process to give them the confidence to actually do what we're asking them to do. So that's one. Two is, you know, when you look at digital our learning outcomes and we talk about being a, a profession that, that values learning and shares our learning, well, how have we digitized those learning outcomes in a way that's meaningful and measurable so that people can follow along and not just on a PDF annual report somewhere that only our leadership may see. Um, the third is, I would say, you know, a lot of a lot of folks now within student affairs are using a legacy type system that's tied into the university's infrastructure, whether it's Banner, PeopleSoft, and so you know, instead of creating another data warehouse in your department, how are you connecting that to the central data warehouse so that other people can benefit from the things you're doing, whether it's the folks in activities who have involvement data, or the folks in career services who are looking at career link, I think we need to start thinking and having that mindset digitally around, is this connected back to the central system, or are we just hogging this data for ourselves? Because I think we need to start connecting that to be more collaborative. And the fourth way I would say, Tony, is like looking at, in your budget, every year allocating a little more budgetary resources to training, to development, and it doesn't have to be things in person while that's while I would love to see that, but you know, using things like atomic learning or other online platforms that could maybe teach them those how to use Photoshop or how to how to use Outlook and Microsoft 365 to so be a little bit better. So it's just this mindset of it doesn't have to it shouldn't be an afterthought anymore. I think folks should really I mean, and I think we're here. It's just given our time and space, I think it's just hard for folks. And so this isn't meant to be you know, a panacea for like solving all your problems. It's more just, how are you doing it now and how can you get better? So, so I, re I read in the book, you, you actually brought up this disconnect and, and the lack of learning opportunities offered by, by the two leading student affairs associations. In practical terms, is there something they could be doing better or, or what should we be doing to, to help us uh, progress in our own practical skills? Yeah, I think in my research when I looked at the past 10 years historically around how student affairs associations such as ACPA and NASPA educated our professional staff, um, you know, over the last five years, I think um, the number of conference presentations 
publications, uh, you know, things related to digital technology exploded because um, I think we were able to demonstrate its, its effectiveness in the late 2000s, early 2010s, and so that's when you know more of that came out. But I still think there is there is a um, a deficit of education at the national conferences. I think they're still slanted towards um, you know very important topics. I think topics that we need to discuss and whether we need to be better as practitioners to present more complex topics that interweave with bigger topics. Whether it's you know I know that I was at NASPA Region One you know yesterday today yeah you know, and the day before and I sat in a session on class identity and I was thinking the presenter. Um, was talking about that topic, and I thought, huh, how does technology overlap into, you know, class identity and some of the things that our students who are from lower income or first gen are experiencing, and how can we start writing more about that? To Josie's point, there are so many un unanswered questions, and yet I feel like unless it's one of us bringing it forward or someone who has been involved in the associations at a higher level, it's harder to get those things put through a traditional, um, uh, educational submission process, if you will, and so I would hope that the associations look at the the frequency and the volume of these types of presentations, and maybe ask presenters to include that as part of what they're talking about. So, how does technology fit in? Or because I think we're asking that about social justice issues, right? How does this topic relate to social justice? I think we need to be as intentional around technology. Excellent. So just, just to add something on to that, um, I think we need to do a lot better partnerships and elevating the knowledge of our ed tech professionals, like our vendors, where, you know, we talk to them in the expo hall, but we won't give them a session because we're fearful they're going to sell something to us. And so I'm reaching out a lot and working with the NASPA Tech KC to try to bridge those relationships to even just have organic conversations and roundtables and hopefully that could lead to sessions to hear what they're seeing on their end because they're starting to hire um, our, our graduates of our programs or new professionals that are actually looking for something new. Uh, so I think there's a lot more knowledge and expertise we can tap into um, and the associations can tap into with our vendors. You, you, you bring up an interesting point. If you look at some associations like the American Marketing Association and Educause, you know, they have, have a much more integral partnership with their vendors, and, and they do do sponsored presentations about, about applications and tools. And, and I know you and I have, uh, have gone to, to Educause, and those tended to be some of the more, more uh, populated sessions, uh, popular sessions. So I, I want to... You brought up social media versus technology. I want to go and, and talk about these mis, often misunderstood terms of digital identity versus digitized development. So Josie, could you briefly talk about your model for developing professional identity and, and help us wrap our head around these the, the differences here? Sure. So just a really quick recap. Digital identity is like self-presentation, um, your reputation, what you're posting out there, who's tagging you, what's searchable um, in an in individual online space. So this is something that I teach college students a ton. Um, explore yourself. What are you posting? What does that mean about um, what you're posting on Instagram um, in order to kind of embrace and have knowledge of what you're typing, what you're putting out there. This idea of uh, digitized development, which I'm honestly going to give shout out to Paul Graham Brown and quote him. Um, in his chapter, he talks about it's a psychological process of growth and self-learning that occurs when digital contexts are introduced. So now it's almost talking about um, a full circle, not just putting things out there, um, but the impact back on self. My perspective on it in my chapter um, is a holistic perspective of how we can start to look at digital identity as a student affairs professional. Um, thinking about your lens, thinking about your experiences, your view of these tools, and I really built it off of the ACPA NASPA competencies in the tech competency. It talks a lot about digital identity, not only educating your students, but having an awareness of your own impact um, in, in what tools and impact that you're using. It also talks a lot about adapting to technology and personal learning networks. So this all wrapped into the results of the study I did on SSAOs, 
who were high users of social media. And I found there was this philosophy that they shared about this value add. Like why, why would a senior vice president want to be on Twitter? But also why would a faculty member or a director of a program? So we love tools. So two of the tools that came out was this digital decision making model. Because I think that's what it comes down to like, well, how do I make this call on my Facebook account or if I should be on Snapchat or not? Uh, and then another byproduct of it was this digital leadership framework, which will come out in a different research. But it's this idea of how you can start to approach these tools holistically as a whole person because a dean of students would say, well, what you see is what you get. So if I like The Walking Dead, I'm going to tweet about The Walking Dead. But I'm also going to you know, promote programs on my campus and celebrate my staff and my students. And so it's, you can have both. But they were able to justify that because they thought about what they wanted their impact to be. So who is it that you want to reach at, at the core? And that might be different on Twitter versus Facebook. Um, if you want to impact and interact and have a relationship with students, figure out and think about well, what tools are they on and, and how willing are you to meet them there? Because then think about the bigger impact. Do you want to be more approachable and more engaged with the student experience? Um, so in my chapter, it basically lays out, let's think about these things for you to reflect on, to answer, so then you feel more confident about joining the awesomeness of Snapchat or creating a Facebook page that's on the professional like page um, because you're able to connect with further through parents and alumni um, and different staff members. And so that's really the call that I put out there is it's okay to be a whole person and be on social media. So I, I had guests on past shows say that if you're in student affairs, you need to have a basic understanding uh, an education around student development. And, and Ed, you say, and I quote, every student affairs professional needs to work on digital identity no matter their title, years of experience, or number of Twitter followers. So my question is why? Are, and are you suggesting that student affairs pros can't be effective in their work without a comprehensive understanding of tech? I think they can be more effective, Tony, if they did. And, you know, again, it goes back to the whole, you know, why are we here? What's the purpose of a student affairs professionals? Why, why do we even exist on college campuses? It's for our students. And if our students are the ones who are using these tools to primarily engage and, think, and like, see the world through that lens and try and make, make understanding and meaning out of their world, then it's important for us to explore those tools, explore these different digital spaces because that's where they occupy. That's how they've gotten to us. Um, coming to campuses with existing communities already you know, to some, I think that th that's, that feels a little threatening because it's like, well, part of our purpose before, before these digital tools was to help them create and find that new community. And while that still exists, I think it's not an either or anymore in that we should, as part of our work, continue to explore and identify and own, this is how I use these, this is how I use these tools, or this is how I feel, this is how I have felt comfortable using these tools. And as a student affairs professional working in this space with students, I have a responsibility to include that as part of my ongoing professional development, not only to learn and understand from different perspectives, but also to apply them, you know, in a space where whether it's within a department, within a division, you know, within an organization like a professional association where you can begin to really you know, unpack and play with these toys that will really make our work, I think, more meaningful and evolve it, right? So. You know, my dissertation was called Redefining Student Affairs. And I, I really do believe that this, these tools, this digital space is, re, is already happening under our feet, redefining who we are, you know, outside of the external pressures that we're getting from the government for unfunded mandates for a variety of things. The still that elephant in the room that's under our feet is this still disconnected use of digital technology across our campuses. Some do it better than others. Some, you know, just, have not opted in on this. And I, I just can't, how, how much longer are you gonna wait, you know, to the detriment, I think, um, or not the detriment, but the, the possibility of, of meeting the students in a new place to really move your programs and services to a new level um, to meet those students. So 
Um, do I think folks can be effective without it? Sure. But I think our students deserve better, and that's why it's worth the investment of time. And to at least have an understanding of it. So I don't think a dean of students or a senior vice president, uh, they all need to be on Snapchat. I do think they need to know what it is. They should ask a student, like, show me this crazy filter thing. I want to be a puppy for a second and screenshot that and send it to me. Um, at least I have an understanding of language, pop culture, and context, um, because that's part of the student experience. Um, so that would be that tech open mindset that we talked about earlier. So Josie, the, the engage, engagement is part of the title of the book here. And, and in chapter five, two co-authors, Liz Gross and Jason Merriweather, discuss student engagement through digital data. So help us understand, what does engagement actually look like in a digital world? You're on mute, sorry. That is not what engagement looks like <laughs> in the digital age. <laughs> um, so what I really like how Liz and Jason set up their chapter is, well, let's start talking about engagement as we've known it um, in the past, in the scholarship. So as a theoretical level, talking about Aston and Tinto and what Ku would say what engagement should look or could look like. And then they built that from Nessie data that now asks about how you can um, help tell the story of student engagement on social media. Um, so like one of the findings was over half of first year students reported that their campus was using social media to help them connect with other students in campus organizations. So that's where they're trying to start to document how types of data that you're already throwing out there, you might be able to weave in that story of engagement. But successful engagement now in this digital age is multifaceted, it's not just technology, we're going to throw all our eggs into Twitter um, or Facebook uh, or face to face. Neither of them can be done alone anymore. Um, and these technology tools can be very powerful, but without a plan, they're kind of just busy work. And so that's what their chapter talks a lot about is what this impact could actually be if you start to tap into some tools for data analysis, analytics, um, that honestly gets become very powerful, and I think Ed can speak to this even stronger with the work that he's doing. Cool. So, Paul Brown, in, in another chapter, refers to digital development as, as it as changes that impact the student's psychological developmental process. So, how does digital engagement relate to some of the more traditional models of development? For example, Chickering or Baxter McCall's self-authorship theory. You know, is there an increasing level of complexity as students discover uh, and, and test out the different social media or technology tools? Joe, so do you want to give that a crack? <laughs> yeah, sure. It's an easy one. Uh, well, the short answer is, uh, based on scholarship, we don't know. I think Paul did a great job of cracking the, the ice open um, for conversations. I know people gave him a hard time like, oh, you're going to create the theory on digital identity development theory. Um, and it, it's going to take time and a lot of great um, academics and practitioners and students that come together to figure out what that is. Um, from my experience in practice is things are different. There is an advanced set of skills and theories that need to address this, as well as theories that need to address the change in um, our student population uh, and demographics. Um, if, if you think about the class of 2020, so our freshman class right now, um, and if we start to apply these same theories that have always existed on them, um, but then if we overlay that with when they could have gotten on these different social media or technology advances. So fifth grader, class of 2020 and fifth grade could have gotten onto AOL Instant Messenger and MySpace Facebook and Twitter and YouTube were part of their middle school experience. Um, Facebook, Instagram, and we're on Snapchat. So what does, how did that change their experience? How did it change who they are today? Those are honestly all answers that we, we have to seek out. But for now, we have to at least recognize that there probably was an impact. And let's start to ask students what that was, how their life view is different. Um, 
And so my work talks about, well, how can we advance this beyond just digital identity conversations to things like digital wellness and incorporating emotional intelligence leadership into my conversations using the social change model to talk about well, what does leadership look like online so we can advance the practice of tools we already have um, and then look to the future about how we can um, create things that really speak to our current college students so you brought you brought up the issue of emotional intelligence and uh, Another colleague of ours, Keith Edwards, today saw saw the episode posted on Facebook, and he and he said, given the reaction to the recent election, can you talk about how you can use digital tools for the purpose of healing? So, any anyone can jump in on that one. So, I think as professionals. <clears throat> As people, we need to address our own grace and space in this. We're having our own experiences on Facebook with friends and family, and our students are as well. And so it kind of humanizes all of us. Uh, I am going to be the keynote at Bacchus in two days, and my talk is supposed to be about digital wellness, and I'm supposed to give them examples of leaders in our world using Twitter for really great ways um, or Facebook to make an impact and we are at a crossroads about figuring out this answer um, and so I think we have to call our own use of the tools out again we a lot of times I see adults look at youth and with negativity and, and frustration why they use the tools but I mean honestly adulting on Facebook is not it's not there right we have to call our own selves out and how we use the tools and so having this idea of having grace and space to be able to take the space that you need to work on yourself, help be a role model to youth that have seen their friends and family act out so aggressively. Like literally I saw a thread of two adults that have kids um, and it was 88 comments long and they just couldn't emotionally stop themselves from adding to those comments without thinking uh, the impact on self and others and maybe I should just give them a phone call and I'll give credit to there was one post in the student affairs Facebook professional page and the one thread that I really celebrated was it was only two comments he said you know what I don't really agree with what you're saying here but are you available later for a phone call because that's where I think we could probably have the most conversation and that's that's amazing right like we need to know when we can have this space and grace that sometimes can't happen online yeah I agree and I wrote a post last week about it about this as well talking about disconnecting I just feel like and I've seen a lot of it I think you both have seen this trend too some of our folks on Facebook are starting or on Twitter are are, are disengaging because they need that time to you know, for their own self-care to not have to consume the kind of content that's out there, whether it's clickbait or their own friends and family and connections saying whatever they need to say. And so to me, it's more for us as, um, you know, so to Keith's question about healing, um, we can't help others till we first help ourselves. So we need to just do that first. We need to make sure that we're okay and that we have that support system that we need to process and move forward and, and support those who need our support right now. Um, because I, I don't think we can do both at the same time. I don't think that's healthy. I think that contributes to some of the things that I think we've done in the past on social media. Um, but then once we are engaged back in, I think it's, it is time for us to use our collective voices more. I mean, I'll own it. I wasn't as active politically on, on social this, this, this cycle mainly because I chose not to, and it, that wasn't the space for me. I was happy to have those conversations in person with folks, but not on social. And now I'm feeling like I sh I, I'm going to be a little bit more and because I'm ready to do that. So I just like, I think if you look at any development theory, I think this is, hap this is happening for most of us uh, on a different level now post-election, no matter which side, you know, folks are on. And so, um, there, we are just. I think a lot too is. I think to Josie's point, giving ourselves grace. We're not gonna. We're not, it's not gonna be perfect. It's gonna be messy, and we all just have to own that. Um, 
some it's going to be easier than for others and i you know obviously that's the, that's true um but to that extent um to keith's question i hope that covers it so so i, I happen to, to see that thread that you're talking about on uh on facebook josie and it, it makes me think there's there is quite a bit that we could do in the qualitative research side just looking at our own uh colleagues and and looking in on the profession on, on what some of the issues and conversations are. And with that in mind. I think we need to role model it. I, need, I think we need to show examples of how it can be done. Because it's not, it's not black and white. It's very gray. Uh, and sometimes you need to call, dial a friend, you know, like take a moment. I would love if someone out there could create a add-on on Facebook that it can pick up the tone, but also the timing. So if you post so quickly back and forth in the comments and it can kind of figure out the emoji behind that, it can maybe make you wait at least a minute or two because I think time would be one of the most fantastic tools to apply within digital tools. So, um, so we can reflect a little bit more. Um, so, yeah. I like it, like an algorithmic timeout, right? Yes. Go to your corner. Um, Got sixty seconds. So, so on on the same same uh, path there, there Ed. So that's one example of how we can kind of explore and analyze digital data. Can you give us some other examples of what might constitute this broad term of dig digital data? Yeah, I think in the book we gave some examples around um, you know the type of social posts that we put out there. Um, you know, of course, followers and, and, and following. But I think today, in student affairs office, one type of digital data I would recommend people really start paying more attention to is their backend website data, um, and looking at not only if you have one website but two. Um, you know, depending on how your how your external facing website, and if you have an internally facing website for your campus community, or if it's just one. I think a lot of times we feel that all our information needs to be out on websites because it's that important. And I think if you really look at the data behind your own website, department, divisional, whatever, it can really tell you a lot about the type of, the type of engagement that's happening on just your websites alone. And that includes data such as frequency, um, unique visitors, and then the time of day. So like what time of day? Um, are people visiting your w website? What day of the week are people most likely coming to your website? Um, because then when you t couple that data with social media data, similarly looking at frequency and time and day of the week, you can begin creating a better strategy with how you, you, know, you wanna engage with people on social media and the type of information people are drawn to on your website. And so you can drill down through Google Analytics to, you know, to a lot of different data sets not just demographic, because I think that's the easy stuff. I think I'm, I'm talking about content analysis. I'm talking about um, you know, keyword searches that people are using to find your content so that maybe you have to do a better job with your search engine optimization. Um, these are the digital mindset pieces that as you develop programs and services have to be part of the planning and implementation and assessment process. Because yeah, it's great if you ask at a, an event, how many of you heard of this on Facebook? But sometimes we have websites connected to this. So asking that additional question of, was it a website that got you here? Was it social media? Um, because we need that more nuanced data and, anal and analyzation in order to really know for sure how people are perceiving us online. So you, you there's so much information that to, to evaluate and analyze around social media and, and technology. You know, we, we've seen recently dedicated positions to compliance and Title IX issues, dedicated positions to assessment and research within student affairs divisions. Do you see senior level roles beginning to be carved out in regards to technology? Oh, absolutely, Tony. I think that it's it's becoming more prevalent. I think it's it, I think it's become more prevalent at larger institutions that have funding and resources available to create um, positions like mine, directors of technology for student affairs um, at other institutions. Um, and so, I think infrastructure-wise, once I think SSAOs collectively realize the power of the data they can they can harness from digital tools and digital spaces. Um, it may it might be connected with other types of assessment positions or 
um, you know, budget, you know, things that you can pull together to have one person do a lot of that data analysis piece for your division. Um, and I think it really does have to be in the central office because we can't continue to ask our folks, you know, in the departments to have to do that on top of their day-to-day -day operational stuff. I just think it's, it is too much. I think there is a, a you know, this tipping point where, well, I got to do my job. The, the day-to-day -day operation of that comes first, and that's true. So I certainly would support you know, the exploration of that through many of our divisions who are looking for those type of opportunities. I mean, happy to share my job description. And I know others out there who work in these type of, and I, I, a bunch of us, we said this at uh, NASPA, we feel like unicorns, like those of us who are doing this, student affairs unicorns, where we don't exactly fit in the traditional student affairs model, and that's OK, because we hope that we can be that proof, that evidence, that when you put these types of positions in place with the right people, that your division can move to the moves to that next evolution to that next step that you may have thought you can do but without the staff you couldn't and so um, you know hopefully that does inspire some SSAOs and VPs to look at that. So Josie, you brought up the some of the conversations and and posts particularly on on Facebook. Uh, we've certainly seen lots of uh, negative and harmful activity on Twitter over the last few weeks regarding the election on both, on both sides. And Laura, Laura Pasquini was one of the co-authors of the, of the book, and she wrote a chapter on establishing social media policies and guidelines. So why do we need them, and what should they cover? Sure. Well, I think this also addresses uh, thinking about language, thinking about approach. So. For example, in the Facebook group, anytime anyone says, well, why are you posting this? You're going to get fired. Like, that's always going to have recourse, right? And I'm not completely answering your question yet. My suggestion was, are you OK? Like, like in a private message, is everything? Usually, it's because other things are going on. They're triggered. They're fueled. Um, you, you telling them you're going to be fired because of this post? isn't helping them further their reflection about social media. So anyway, answer your question. Uh, so social media policies and guidelines, uh, her chapter, uh, and Laura's done a ton of work on this, and you should go check it out on her website as well, is the process that one can go through that doesn't allow you to just say, well, we're just going to grab this policy from a institution that's like us and throw it on our website because you do have to answer the questions, the philosophy, the, the bigger understanding and reasons for why because you want that policy and those guidelines to work for you uh, and to fuel the mission and the programs that you have. So she starts it with assessment and like um, Ed was just talking about knowing the data, knowing what's out there, having what she calls a social media advisory group a group that's talking about not just the small details and strategy of social media, but this bigger picture of like what would we, what would we want this to look like um, in students, youth, in professionals, youth, and faculty, and then have an audit. And I've done this on campuses where it always kind of blows our minds when you actually count up all the Facebook accounts from Res Life pages to Twitter accounts. You probably have a lot of accounts out there you don't even realize. Some of them are old, some of them might be duplicates, some of them you don't have passwords for anymore. And so it's time to actually rein those in. So now you have a lay of the land to know what's out there. And then you can start thinking about, these are our platforms we have out there. This is working, this isn't. Think about goals, now think about your strategy. And now finally you're going into the policy drafting phase. And her chapter lays out some really great ideas in to do that, but it also doesn't end there. Uh, Ed talked about this earlier that we need training, we need support. Every week, Snapchat has a new update. Your Blackboard may change, your learning management system may change drastically to be able to incorporate how to best connect with your online students there. Um, and so that needs to be part of the strategy and the guidelines as well. I would also add, Tony, that it's important for folks on campuses that um, you know, if it's a state institution that sometimes they can't create policy, that they can only create guidelines and that the board can only create policy. So depending on the guiding doc, the purpose of those guiding documents for staff, it's really important to use Laura's chapter as a framework to start looking at data gathering and figuring out what might work best on their campus. Um, but, you know, 
I think a lot of our campuses have these committees, whether they're chaired by the folks in marketing communication or in IT, and that you know maybe we have a seat at them. But if there aren't those type of committees or those groups now, I encourage folks to really start exploring how they can do that on their campuses and build those cross-divisional partnerships to get that work done. Because if there is no policy, if there is no, if there are no guidelines or handbooks to help at least give folks a starting point around these digital tools, then um, that has to be a priority. Otherwise, you know, in the absence of information, people make up their own. And so I, I want people to be on the same page with their use of it because it only affects it can only negatively affect the student experience if they're not together on that. I, I think you make a good point that uh, it, it varies from institution to institution, right? Uh, speech guidelines, speech rules are, are much different in, in private versus public institutions. And Josie, I love the, the idea of an audit. Is, is that like a, a, a patented tool that you're going to come out with soon? I think it's honestly asking people to show their cards. Like, what do you got buried in your office? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we just use a simple Google um, Google tool, like a survey. Like, just let us know what you have. And other institutions that are further along in this process, they then kind of shift this into, well, you have to report these in order for them to be approved and placed on the website. Um, so that is at a, at a higher other level. Um, so yeah. Cool. So we, we have a, a question from the Twitterverse. It, it's a two-part question. Are, are there any apps or platforms that are just hitting the market that we should watch out for? And are there any apps or platforms that aren't being widely used anymore that perhaps we should consider dropping or, or fading into the dust? I'll start. Um... You know, we've, we've seen more of the virtual reality stuff popping up. I know it's been around for a while, but I feel like more campuses are starting to really get creative with their marketing and communications around virtual reality, on, on use of drones and things like that. And so I don't necessarily have an app recommendation today, but I would explore with your folks on campus, did you buy a drone recently? Do you have one? Like, if you notice your, com your school's commercials have more aerial shots, be like, so was someone on a crane or was that like a drone? Like how did you get those shots, right? Because if in fact you are allowed to purchase a drone for your institution for, you know, for video, for communication purposes, or your central marketing communication office has one, why not record stuff during commencement? Why not record stuff during orientation and homecoming? Because those shots are going to be absolutely integral to your future marketing or your future website development. I mean, that those pieces of content on your phone, if you can figure out how to use the VR feature to get access of like, you know, the 360 view, those are becoming more and more reg you know, regularly used um, through social media campaigns. And so um, I would say that those are some of the cooler things that if you can get your hands on or get involved with, I think it'd be a lot of fun to see more of that kind of content out there. I just want to be clear, you're not suggesting we go back to Second Life, right? No, I would not say that, but I would suggest that there are applications that we could learn from that, that time in our, in our digital history that still could apply today if we really, especially in the classroom, especially in the classroom. I just feel like there's great opportunities for virtual reality pieces that, um, you know, I think if we got, if we were given, not given permission, but if we gave ourselves that liberty to, to, to give it a try, I think we'd find some really cool things. You know, you bring, you bring up drones, and, and I don't know if it's something that's local here in New Jersey, but it's actually a homeland security issue on campus here. So you have to register your drone. You actually have to go through training to use the drone. So, you know, in the past, we just would go buy something and, and go out and use it. It's, it's actually a, a pretty complicated process to, to get approved to be a drone operator around here. Josie? Well, I would be really interested to see the first campus that uses the Snapchat glasses um, in telling their story. I don't tweet it out if you know of a campus that's that's using that new piece of technology. It's and it's very affordable. I mean, considering it's one hundred and thirty dollars, I think. Can you explain it? I mean, obviously, you put on these glasses, like Google Glass, but it's just for Snapchat. So it's obviously like your from your view perspective, and it's an ability to capture what you're seeing and then put that on Snapchat. Oh, I can see some data. And, and, and the glasses look 
pretty good and considering like you could pass for it not just being a piece of tech but like some fashion so so either of you have one yet no no i uh, hope joe sabato is watching somewhere i'm sure he has one <laughs> i if anyone has it, it's joe for sure um, but I also feel like there's a lot more ways that campuses can be using live stream and even more apps are available to use it that makes it more accessible and easy to use. So going live on Facebook, you don't have to go somewhere else like Periscope or actually I think Meerkat is gone now, right? Um, to be able to show that student ex experience live, do question and answer live, I think we're going to start to see a lot more of that. And you can do that on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer. So again, making a lot of these tools more accessible um, and immediate, which can be very um, positive for our campuses. And then something that I just discovered, and I'm not the early adopter on everything, but I'm in love with Slack. I'm sorry, it's like changed my life in group communications and project management. So, and it's free. Can you, can you explain that? Uh, so, uh, Slack is an app that you can also download on your desktop that sets up channels of communication uh, between a groups of people. So think about basically like a group chat on Facebook or all your email threads. I'm um, not being in your email, but in a Slack channel, and you can or organize them by category. Um, so it's, it's my new favorite app. All right, I'm going to have to look that up after the show today. So you, you both acknowledge in your editor's note that producing a book, a text about technology, is challenging given the, the, rapid, chase, uh, the rapid pace of change in the world. So if you had more time, what, what chapter or chapters would you have liked to have added? I'll start. Um, I think, and Tony, you'll appreciate this um, given our history together, but I think um, a chapter on um, data visualization, on presentations, on the idea that we need to, as a profession, snap out of our PowerPoint funk and become better at educating and educating others. Like, I just feel like, you know, with every conference I go to and with every, you know, department meeting or department, you know, committee that we sit in and we see our, our colleagues through no fault of their own, this is how they're trained and how they're comfortable presenting information, presenting it in the most bland and boring ways. I feel like a chapter on that, and maybe you fold it into a marketing chapter overall, right? But I feel like the visualization of our data, the visualization of our presentations and engagement, I think we need to be, I think, a bit more prescriptive with folks, even though, yes, on the front end, it takes a lot more time because you got to learn and you got to switch your thinking. But we all, the three of us on this call and many others who have experienced this awakening, it's like, yeah, now, now that I get it, I can't see myself doing it another way because it does make it more engaging for the audience. And I think we present often because it's for our, because it's what we're most comfortable with, and we have to remember our audience and what they're most comfortable with. And the data is too clear that we were we were wired to visualize fast, right? Not to read fast. And so, I think that's the chapter I would have added. Cool, Josie. You know, I think it would have been really enlightening and refreshing to have a chapter written by students and sharing their life view of technology uh, in college before, how they're using it, how they're seeing other students, what their view of professionals using these tools. Because again, that goes back to the heart of why we're doing this, making the impact, um, assessing uh, that community that we're building. I have found the more that I'm including students to fuel what I do, um, that it, um, it solidifies it even further, but we're not giving a lot of time for to hear students um, not just what they're tweeting about but actually in conversations to talk about well, what do these tools really mean to you? I um, mean, what do you need from us? So we, we have just about five minutes of time left and I got a special request from uh, one of the moderators on the back channel today to do a quick lightning round so here we go. You ready for lighting on? Uh, okay, we're ready. All right. Favorite mobile app? Ed. Waze. <laughs> Snapchat. Uh, oh, yeah, I could have guessed that one. All right. Um, favorite social network? Ed. 
uh, Facebook? Well, mine's the same, Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> Least favorite social network, Ed. Google Plus. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. Hold oh, on, time out. <laughs> Do I need to go back and find the email that said you've got to give it a chance? It's going to come around? I saw that too. I did, I did, I did, I did, I did, okay. Doesn't mean we have to like it right now. That's true. All right. It's, it's still coming around, right, Ed? No, <laughs> I own it, man. No. <laughs> All right, Josie. My least favorite is Waze. It has done me wrong in LA. Oh, yeah. Ed tried to get me on Waze. I, I'm not going for it either. Um, maybe it's a Boston thing. Who knows? All right, favorite website, Ed. Oh, favorite website. Um, BSULife.com. Oh, good answer. Josie. <laughs> uh, I mean, I use Pew Internet Research constantly. Cool. All right, favorite online resource. Josie, is it the same, Pew Internet Resource? Well, you can go to JosieAlquist.com. There's some resources there. You can't pick your own website as your favorite <laughs> online resource. This is rapid fire, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ed. Uh, HBR, Harvard Business Review. Oh, good one. I love All that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, best social network for student outreach and engagement. Ed. Uh, Facebook. Snapchat, Julie? It honestly depends on your campus. I go to some campuses and Twitter is thriving where Facebook, others, I, that's the one to go to. So it honestly depends on your campus. Cool. That would, that would be an interesting regional study. Uh, favorite, favorite photo editing tool, uh, Ed. Oh, Photoshop. No wait, 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 wait. I can't. Facetune. You had to look it up. I did. Well, I'm not good with words. <laughs> I don't know words. Facetune is a photo <laughs> editing tool. Face space. Yeah. What is it? Face Facetune. All right. I'm gonna research that too. <laughs> um, iPhone or Android, Ed. Droid. Wait, I thought you switched. Nope. Samsung, nope. Samsung Galaxy S7. Didn't Shout out to on, my team. Light on fire? It's okay? That's the note, man. Come oh, on. Oh, sorry. That's the note. Come on. Josie? I found. All right. Cool. And what was the, the last one? What was the first social networking site that you were on? Ed? Uh, GeoCities. Like the yacht, that Yahoo thing where you could create create a website and chat. So yeah, back in the day. Wow. Yeah. Josie. Uh, AOL Instant Messenger. Nice. Yeah, we still love that little thing. <laughs> Your mail is here. Cool. All right, so we're we're nearing the end of our time here. Final question: Could can I ask each of you to, to share a few resources, websites, books, conferences, newsletters, association? Uh, with the audience that can help them con to continue to learn about and explore some of the topics discovered, uh, covered during today's show. Ed? Yeah, so I would say for folks out there uh, watching, Educause's eCar, um, the, their, their Center for Research is excellent and puts out some great content on technology, um, not only in the IT space, but also how it crosses over to, higher, to, to the rest of higher ed. And so, I would highly recommend looking at eCar on Educause's website and to Josie's point, Pew. Um, PEW, I think they do some great work as well. Cool. Josie. So talking about the competencies, the ACPA NASPA competency rubrics just came out. So check those out um, for the one for technology, which will be um, hopefully applicable to your work. Uh, there's a book that I don't think it's talked a lot about, but could be really beneficial if you're looking to maybe get your president on board with social media. It's called Hashtag Follow the Leader, Lessons in Social Media Success from Higher Ed CEOs. It's um, by Dan, and I'm not going to pronounce his last name right, Dan Zant. Maybe. Um, Lisa Endersby and I brought a team of writers together for a new directions in student leadership that's coming out in February called Going Digital in Student Leadership. Um, Laura Pasquini and uh, Paul Eaton uh, are on doing this research project called Network Communities of Practice. If you are an ACPA member, I'm pretty sure you got an email to take their survey. They basically want to know how you're using these tech tools um, 
through our community building perspectives. And then I just kicked off a podcast. I'd love for you to check it out. Give me feedback. I bring in leaders and users of tech through the lens of leadership um, and social media. Do you have a show lined up that you want to talk about? I just released one today with uh, Mr. Jeff Des, who's from Trill or Not Trill. We talk about using pop culture um, in leadership development, how you can be a real person on Snapchat. And he also gives some reflections about how we need to do the work post-election on ourselves, on our students, in our families, and so on. So JosieAlquist.com backslash podcast. Great. So, certainly a timely topic. Did you have something else, Ed? Yeah, I just want to shout out to our to our chapter authors who helped Josie and I on this project. I mean, they were just fantastic to work with and instrumental in getting this project together. Um, shout out also to the the our editors, um, you know, Dr. specifically Susan Jones, um, who was just great to work with on the project. And so we're grateful for that opportunity. I just want to make sure we shout out all of our authors. So thank you. Yeah, it was quite an all-star cast uh, in, in this book, and I'm sure it won't be the last uh, collaboration you all do. So, so thank you both for, for taking the time. Always fun, always uh, informative to, to have you both on. Uh, thank you also to ACPA and Higher Ed Live for sponsoring today's show. Heather will be back in early December to talk about uh, student activism, uh, particularly around the time of the election. Uh, again, a very timely episode, I think. And then Heather is actually flying out to New Jersey uh, for an, on December 15th, and we're going to hope to broadcast live. We're going to do another version of contested debates, uh, again, hopefully live, and we've got a pretty cool cast lined up uh, with some great topics. So, so. More, stay tuned to, to hear more about that. You can receive reminders about this and other great shows by subscribing to Higher Ed Live's newsletter. You can also browse the archives at higheredlive.com or subscribe to our iTunes podcast. I'm Tony Duty. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you make it a great week, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.